Today, a spotlight on Mitchum, postcode 3132. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where I've noticed post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. So I thought today I would make another recording based on one of my recent one-to-ones and look at a Melbourne postcode, which is going through something of a transition at the moment, but still represents some fair value relative to other postcodes in and around Melbourne. And once again, just to re-emphasize, the analysis is based on my available information at the moment. It may change. This is not financial advice. And it really is a matter of a point in time observation. Things will change ahead. But I do use my core market model, which includes information based on our rolling household surveys. So that gives us quite a lot of detailed information to which we can decode. The core market model takes mortgage stress data, the price trajectory information, the buying and selling intention from our surveys, the data on migration, and also economic data, CPI, wages, and employment. We put all of that into our core market model, overlay the various scenarios, and we can then form an opinion as to what may happen. It's not a prediction, it's just an opinion based on what we see at the moment, and it will change ahead. And in passing, let me say two things. Firstly, if you'd like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me about a particular suburb, you're welcome to contact me via the DFA blog. There is a bit of research that is required and there is a cost attached. All that information is available via the link from my blog. And also say, if you are interested in a summary on the YouTube channel, if you make a request, I'll keep a list of it and I'll add it to those that I may get to in due course. No promises but I am always interested to see where people are interested in my looking. So now let's look at Mitcham 3132, which of course is east of the centre of Melbourne. And it's surrounded by the East Link Toll Road. And it's got a number of other major roads running through it as well. Formerly, Mitcham is a suburb of Melbourne. It's 20 kilometres east of Melbourne's central business district. Its local government area is the city of Whitehorse. And in the 2016 census, Mitcham had a population of 16,148. It'll be larger now. And of course, the new census data will be out sometime in the next few months. And here are just a few shots. The major roads run through the centre of the suburb. There's quite a lot of commercial property along those drags, as well as some high rise development, which I'll come to in a second. It is quite sprawly, but I will highlight that there is a lot of traffic at the moment. And in fact, there are a lot of parking places required because of the high density of population there now. And as I've mentioned, along the main drags, there are a number of higher rise developments now and more are planned. So it is a location in transition. And if you head off towards the area around the station, again, more higher rise properties, lots of car parks, and you can begin to see that there is quite a lot of redevelopment underway. And of course, there is the station, which allows relatively easy access to the city. Now away from that, there are still a number of streets with older style properties, both single and double storey. Quite a few of them are of a certain age and style but they are slowly being knocked down and rebuilt. That said, there are still some relatively quiet areas in some roads, but the pace of construction is pretty fast. And quite often when properties are knocked down, they are then subdivided because the plots are actually quite large. And the planning does allow subdivision quite often either two or four on one single plot. And as you look around, you begin to see quite obvious developments in a number of areas where multiple residences, both apartments and villas, are occupying the place of a single older style property that's been demolished and rebuilt. And some of those developments are indeed of a higher density. And I will just make mention that there is a big private hospital and other medical facilities in the area too. And that provides a significant additional demand for property and also 
an additional demand for rental property from people working in the various hospital complexes. So now let's look at what is on the market, both units and houses at the moment. And when I checked, there were 57 properties for sale in Mitcham. And here is a map showing the distribution. It's relatively well spread. And if we start looking in a bit more detail, quite a few of the properties go for auction. There are also some with a price tag, for example, this one at $950,000. That will be a relatively new subdivision. Quite a few of the older style properties, though, go to auction. And quite often, when some of the older style properties do come up, it's more for the land than it is the property itself. The number of apartments is definitely rising, and the bulk of houses do go to auction rather than private sale. Although, when I was talking to one of the agents, they did say that at the moment, there are quite a few sales agreed before auction. There are some older style, small apartments, as well as some more modern apartments as well. And of course, one of the challenges is an older style property might be knocked down by a builder, so they might well want to compete with people looking to buy to live. And in terms of the apartment markets, of course, once you buy a new development or a newly redeveloped apartment, it is no longer new, and that has a bit of downward pressure on price subsequent. But there are quite a few auctions around, and interestingly, talking to the agents again, the clearance rates are not particularly high at the moment. In terms of what's sold, in the past eight weeks, 54 properties have sold. And here is the map showing their distribution. And as I always say, when I talk about sold information, when there's an auction, there's no information about the price that it was agreed at. And if it was sold before auction or private treaty, the last asking price is cited, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has anything to do with the price agreed or settled. And I would highlight there the last asking price for Colombo Street, which is quite close to the station, was a pretty cheap $290,000 for a one bedroom apartment. And as we look down the list of sold properties, both houses and apartments have got shifted. And you can begin to get a bit of a feel that a house price of one to two million is quite feasible, depending on the particular property. Apartments tend to be a little cheaper, of course. Another one in Colombo Street seems to be quite popular, or maybe just a lot of property for sale. Three hundred and forty-nine to three hundred eighty-four thousand dollars was the last asking price range. And I will just highlight that some of the new developments are effectively cookie cutter properties that are thrown up relatively quickly, relatively cheaply, and one wonders about their quality of construction. So what I would conclude from looking at this is there is a wide range of properties available. There is quite a lot of demand for property. And as a result of that, the pricing is quite interesting. And, uh, you know, you have to really go into some detail to understand individual properties to know what true value is. And as I mentioned earlier on, some are being sold now prior to auction. And in some cases, the settlement price is well below the auction price because some vendors are very keen to sell and quite quickly on the assumption that property prices may slide a bit ahead. And once again, we see a wide range of properties from well over a million for houses to relatively inexpensive apartments which takes us to the pricing trends. Well, let's look at units first. So the first observation is the average gain over the last 10 years is 4.4% per annum, or if you adjust for inflation, 2.4% per annum. And the trajectory of prices is relatively straightforward. In 2014, the median price for a unit was 547,000. It went up by 12.4% in 2015. It rose by 8.9% in 2016. The median price dropped by 2.2% in 2017 to 655,000. It rose in 2018 by 6.9% to 700,000. It remained flat in 2019. 
It rose 7.1% in 2020 to 750,000. In 2021, it rose 4.7% to 785,000. And so far, year to date, prices have eased back just a little to 775,000. So you can see there's been a steady incline upwards over the years. And houses, well, they've done probably a little better. The average gain is 6.6% per annum or 4.6% after inflation. So that's slightly better than units. Back in 2014, the median house price was 715,000. A year later, it was 870,000, up 21.7%. So there was a very significant upkick in 2015. In 2016, it went up 6.9%. In 2017, 15.1%. It moved down 7% in 2018, back below a million, 995,000. It slid again in 2019, down another 5%. It rose in 2020, up 10.6% and over a million dollars again, up another 13.5% at 1.18 million in 2021, and a further small rise in 2022 to $1.19 million median price. And just a quick summary of the overall postcode, there were around 92 listings at the moment with 56 added in the past month. So there are quite a few coming on. In May 2019, the listings were lower at 77 and around 78% are houses, the rest are units. So this is still a relatively house based rather than unit based segment. But of course, it is changing thanks to the redevelopment I mentioned earlier on and the zoning does facilitate that. The vacancy rates are 1.4% compared with 1.7% in mid-May 2019. And there are around 34 vacancies currently reported compared to 37 in 2019, so relatively stable. The gross yields, which is the comparison between the purchase price and the full assumed rental for houses is 2.4%. That's a slight fall from 2.6% last year. Generally, Melbourne gross rental generally Melbourne gross yields are not that flash. And the net yield is about 1.25% and is falling. The net yield takes account of the other costs of managing the property, including maintenance and repairs. Rents for houses are rising up 12% in the last quarter. Typical rent of $480 per week for houses. And the asking price is on average falling with a typical asking price of just over a million dollars. The average settlement is around 6% lower than asking, but it does vary by a particular property. And there is a slightly increased intention to sell currently, which I'll come back to a bit later. With regard to units, the gross yields are about 3.9%. That's a fall from 4.7% last year. The net yield is about 2.25% and is falling. The rents for units are also falling down 1.8% over the quarter with a typical rent of $415. The asking price on an average unit is up 9% at the moment with a typical unit price of $620,000. The average settlement, though, is about 5% lower than asking, and the intention to sell is also rising just slightly. If I then look at my stress data, this is from my surveys, there are about 6,800 households, of which 2,900 are borrowing, 2,500 are renting, and there are just under 1,900 properties for rent. Mild mortgage stress is around 1,499, severe stress 180, Overall, 58% of households are registered as mortgage stress. And that's, of course, a cash flow measure, money in, money out. So many households, 58%, that's a high number, are finding it quite difficult with cash flow at the moment. And that's, of course, a combination of relatively large mortgages plus no real income growth while cost of living are rising very fast. And the risk of defaults about 3% or 92 over the next 12 months. If I turn to rental stress, around half of renters are also in some financial flow difficulty as well, 1,255. And from an investment perspective, around 28% of property investors, or 513, are struggling with their investment property, meaning that they can't either sell the property that they're trying to sell, or the rental stream they're getting is insufficient to cover the costs of the investment. And of that, 93, relatively small number, 
are in severe stress, so significantly underwater. And here is a trend chart for the last few months from my modelling, which just highlights the fact that rental stress has been very significant through COVID, but it's a little eased now. Whereas investor stress is on the rise and mortgage stress is also relatively high. And overall financial stress is easing back slightly, but that's predominantly thanks to rental stress coming off its highs. So finally, we'll just talk about price scenarios. As always, I run three scenarios. My best case, that is assuming that the economic activity continues positively. The mid case and the worst case, in the worst case, we can assume that interest rates rise. Perhaps there's another COVID round and also an international crisis as well. So that's the worst case. For my modelling and for my scenarios, I go with the best case scenario. So I'm estimating that for this year, there will be almost no increase in value for units. Next year, there will be a small increase. And the following year, a slight decrease. These are cumulative numbers. So 2% higher by 2024. And if I then apply that to the analysis of the median price, currently we're looking at prices of around $775,000 for a medium priced unit. And I'm looking for a little fall this year, followed by a 3% rise next year to $795,000, and then a small fall in 2023. So there is certainly not going to be a very significant hike in prices over the next three or three years. And remember, this is my best case. The worst case scenario would see more of a fall. Turning to houses, again, very little happening this year in my best case scenario. A bit of a rise next year up to 9% and a further rise in 2024 to give 5.1% higher over the next three years. That's my best case scenario. The worst case scenario is a fall of 12.7% over three years. And here is the trend information once again, showing that the current $1.19 million would be roughly the same over the next year. A small rise in 2022 up to $1.22 million and a further rise up to $1.25 million in 2023. So there is some growth, but nothing like the growth we saw in 2015, up 21% or 2017 at 51%. And even last year in 2021 at 13.5%, we don't think that will be sustained over the next 12 months. So in summary, this is an area again in transition with a number of older style properties coming up onto the market and being bought up by developers. In some cases, those properties are being subdivided and the planning regulations allow for that. There is higher density development along some of the main drags. And again, the planning allows for more than that, more of that ahead. And so the expectation is that the densities in the area will continue to grow. The congestion at peak times is already pretty bad. And so we should expect that to get considerably worse from a pricing perspective. There has been some growth over the last year or so, but the rate of growth is going to slow over the next two or three years, in my view, based on the current information I've got. So if you're thinking of purchasing in this area, you should be thinking of purchasing for the longer term and doing your calculations on the assumption that there won't be a lot of capital growth over the next two or three years. The other point to make is that the access to the city via the trains as well as the main roads makes it quite attractive. And so there is quite a lot of demand for this area. And I think going forward, demand here will still stay quite strong, which puts some downside support. So if my worst case scenarios were to play out, I think this would be still a relatively stable area compared with some of those areas further out where we would project that falls would be more significant. Well, I hope you found that useful. Do leave your comments below. And as I said earlier on, if there's a particular suburb you'd like me to analyse, do leave a note. I don't promise to do it, but I do keep a list of those of interest. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.